Welcome to week five of social marketing. This is the week where the work that you've done in market segmentation, in strategy, in identifying a social problem, in all of the lead up material comes to fruition. Because now you're going to select the market. For assessment purposes, you only get to select a single market. And this is one of the house rules I operate to in all of my subjects is because it's a training run, we focus on a single solitary target market. However, in the business, when you're actually doing this as a social marketer, we talk in terms of plurals. We talk about market segments, and then we talk about the priority order in which you will address those segments. So there will always be a first market. There will always be a number one market that you will first address and you will then move on to your next audiences. So, what you're going to come across in this slide deck is a mix of component parts from commercial marketing textbooks. A Kotler International Marketing Text, a Strategic Marketing Text, an Intro to Marketing Text, and a CV Text. Because social marketing is all about the adaptation and adoption of the marketing that is already in existence. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can just simply put what we already know as commercial marketers into effect in responding to the social problem we're trying to address. So the first step in the market and the segmentation, targeting and positioning. Identifying the basis for segmenting a market and there are so many different ways to do this, but top of the list of your criteria would be responsiveness to the social problem and the social solution. We then build a set of profiles. This is where we start looking at alternatives. This is where we start having the capacity to, as social marketers, think what would it look like if we had 80 or 90% of the audience, 80 or 90% of a total market on our side? To get to that level of adoption, how many different market segments will we need to develop? How many different product offerings? Where will we introduce the product? Where will we be able to grow the product offerings? So you Build a wide-ranging set of profiles. You will also profile audiences who won't be of interest. And this is one of the things that in a full-scale commercial social marketing operation, you will develop market segmentation profiles for people who you don't want to address. These could be communities of opposition. These could be stakeholders. But they will be people who you need to understand them, you need to profile them, and appreciate that you're not going to target them. Third step in the process is where we start thinking about the targeting, and we think about audience attractiveness. And this is your priority matrix. This is where you start working in terms of which target audience is first, on the basis of successfully addressing that audience, which audience, which target market then becomes the easiest market for you to move into after that. Now, in some campaigns, you will launch a multi-target, multi-market approach in your opening number. They will be difficult, they will be costly, but they will also be based on the idea of a priority list of audiences who, upon capturing those markets, will open up 
new opportunities. So you build up a profile of attractiveness, you select your target segments. Now for this round we'll talk singular. You will then build the positioning strategy for each target segment. And this is one of the things about marketing is that we are very, very prone to circular production. If you look at the six steps, you are going to repeat tasks on a regular basis. When you profile your segments, part of what you may have in that profile is perceptions of the problem, perceptions of the solution, component parts that will help you build a good positioning profile. What you can have at step four is your priority could be clustered around, your prioritization framework could be clustering around your positioning. And then down to step six, having built and assigned a desired positioning strategy, once you implement your marketing mix, you may then be going, well, what does this do for the position? So you may be revising your positioning strategy based on your marketing mix. Going back and forth between segmentation, targeting, and positioning, cycling around, is an important facet of being a marketer. You will loop through the data sets, which is why I always encourage people to keep their notes, document carefully, document clearly, because you might be coming back to that market. So, decision consequence time. The first thing that you want to be thinking about here is that for each audience, you want a single strategy. You want to have a responsive audience and you want to have an audience that if you engage them is an effective engagement, that they will respond back. The thing about the decision consequences from the segmentation to the choice of markets to the positioning is that your effective segmentation will create a couple of decisions. The first thing on your segmentation, to be effective, it's got to be measurable. So this brings you some of the concepts from market research, some of the concepts from the SMART objectives. If you can't measure it, then it's going to be very difficult to determine if the audience responds. But also, when you think about this from the point of view of social marketing, if you are trying to change an attitude, it may be very difficult to measure the attitude as it stands. So you'll be looking for proxy measures of attitude in terms of behavior, behavioral conduct. Similarly, you can be looking for proxy measures of behavior. There are different ways that you don't necessarily have to measure directly, but you do have to be able to measure. Accessibility is the extent to which you can reach an audience. And this is critical in social marketing. We have problems that we want to solve, but if we can't reach the audience, then that audience can't be addressed. It doesn't matter how keen we are to implement this idea if the audience is off limits to us because we don't have the distribution channel, we don't we will be blocked from distributing into those markets, then they're not accessible, they're not an effective segment. We also have the, the concept of the substantiality. And this is segments being socially profitable or large enough to engage. Now, I'd remind you that 2.5% of any given audience is expected to be an innovator. So when we talk about substantial, we can talk to small numbers. We can do audiences of one and we have a whole subdomain of marketing which is basically the sub-niche marketing, the audience of one, because what 
we're looking for is if we get that first prime audience, they will bring other audiences with them. So the question here is again about prioritization. Who's the first audience? Who's the most important audience? Effectively, what you're trying to create though is a homogenous group, internally similar and differentiated from other groups so that it's worth pursuing them with a focused marketing program. And this is why I talk about single specific targeted groups because you want to be able to tailor a marketing program to that audience. And that leads us down to the actionability. If you can't tailor a marketing mix to that segment because you don't have a clear enough view of that segment, go back and measure. If you can't put the mix in front of them properly, then your distribution channel will fail and you'll lose your accessibility function. In terms of selecting some audiences, what this framework is getting you to think about is the attractiveness of the segments and the capacity of your organization. And I want to point something out to you is that this is the premium commercial marketing way of thinking. Yeah, go for the high attractive audience where you've got your strengths. And as social marketers, on a regular basis, we will be sent off to deal with the low attractive, low strength. Because our worst prospects are the ones in the greatest need. So if you are, by the way, the, the, highest, the best prospects, the high attractiveness, high strength, are occasionally dismissively referred to as the low hanging fruit. And it's a stupid phrase, and it's always used dismissively like, <laughs> well, I guess you're just doing the easiest way of having the most success. Again, a really stupid, stupid idea. You don't take a 100 meters sprinter and throw them into a swimming pool just because they can run fast. You put them on the running track. Best prospect, best fit. What we also find though on a regular basis is attractive markets, but where we've got a low organizational strength. And this is kind of a common social marketing element of, we'd really like to address that group, but we don't know anything about them. And that's every adult camp, every adult social marketer who's ever been told, get a teenager, address teenage markets. But again, ideal scenario is that you go for your best prospect. Realistically, as a social marketer, what you're looking at in this framework is, what are my organizational strengths? Where am I being, where am I most likely to have to deal? What's my audience most likely going to fit into? Worst, not so great. We need to try harder and ideal. So. Segmentation, slice up the audience, slice up the markets, have multiple options at your disposal. Because now it's time to go targeting. And in targeting, we are looking at a whole series of different ways of slicing this up. And this is taken from a strategy text, uh, Hooli Tooth thousand and something, uh, 2004 I think. What you're looking at here is that if you already have a market and many social marketing campaigns will be extending on something you're already doing. So any road safety campaign that exists or that will be run will be building on an audience who is already being addressed by road safety campaigners. And that's the thing to consider here is whether your particular campaign has companions, whether you've been part of this, whether someone else is in this area. And your targeting in this is to ask the question of, well, 
which of the five current people do we want? Now, would you want the end user of your social marketer, the social marketing problem, so the person for whom the problem is going to be solved by them engaging, do you want the person who's going to enable that end user, say the purchaser, the person who's going to suggest and support the end user in their actions, the influencer, the person who's going to go first, get the ball rolling and say, hey, here's a problem, we should possibly try the solution. Or in the case of where you are dealing with proxies, where you desire a behavior from a group of people who have someone else as their decision maker. And this is group purchasing behavior, this is family purchasing behavior, this is organizational purchasing behavior. These are your current customers. Who's the one you want in order to increase the audience? But also, thinking about your market segments, have you sliced them up by who uses your product, who decides if the product's going to be used, who pays the price for the use of the product, who supports or hinders the use of the product? So let's talk the criteria for differentiating some markets here. And again, the critical thing is that in the market segmentation, you give yourself multiple opportunities. You don't just walk in and go, I have one end user to go thanks. You set up a menu. You set up a spectrum. You can use a whole bunch of different decision-making frameworks. But ultimately, it comes down to, if you're going to separate an audience, how does the audience differ on these criteria? How important is the social solution to them? How important is the problem? What level of affordability is there? Is this a solution that is quick, cheap, and easy if you have financial resources? Is it a solution that goes from quick, cheap, and easy to slow, cheap, and easy if you can't afford it financially and you have to sink time into it? And from your point of view, which audiences? The criteria is here are things like, can we communicate with them? Will it be a positive use of our resources? Will this be the best use of our resources to engage with this audience? Will we get a net gain in society by dealing with that audience as my priority audience? So, decision time. Let's do this. Thinking about your audiences, thinking about your customers, thinking about potential current and potential customers, what you want to think, how small can you make this segment and still be valuable? Are you playing offense or are you playing defense in this segment? One of the considerations to make is, do you need to run a defensive strategy to address a social marketing solution to an audience who might be prone to abandoning your product. We think here about a lot of the equality movements. We think here about a lot of the movements where we feel that, or we felt in the late 90s that this was done, this was solved, and never considered the idea that there was going to be a counter push. That the idea that all humans have an inherent right to safety is not that inherent. The idea that everyone should have equal legislative and legal freedoms under the eyes of the law is not an inherent agreed upon principle for all audiences and all markets. There are some markets that will go and push their own personal social group as their superior as the superior 
audience who should have greater legislative and legal rights than others. And if you have successfully established equality in a marketplace, you will need to occasionally run defensive social marketing campaigns to fend off people who are trying to push inequality. Similarly, if you are pushing inequality and you're pushing dominance and you are pushing uh, segregation and you are pushing a whole range of social beliefs of an inherent superiority of your social group over another, you too will need to run defensive campaigns to block equality. So you've got to look at this in terms of is this a market audience that if I hold this audience another idea can't get traction? Consider the celebrity audiences for vaccination. We assumed an inherent merit on vaccination and we didn't defend against the quite influential but not highly informed audience leader. You want to look at, again, this is the practical side rather than the assessment side. This is real about really seriously in the practice is how stable is the market segment? How durable are the market differences that you've identified? Things like operating systems are important, but things like age are a really important element to consider that if you're going to run a five-year campaign that starts with 13-year-olds, they will be 18 by the end of that campaign's lifespan. You will go through five runs, five rounds of 13-year-olds. And if you're looking at a 10-year campaign, you are looking at at least two, possibly three shifts in what is fashionable, interesting, or of concern to 13-year-olds inside a 10-year window where your audience is defined by the one age block. So the durability is, yes, 13 is an important point in age and coming of age and years and so forth, but what they care about will be different by each generation coming through. So the durability of the market difference is critical. You also want to very seriously, and as social marketers, this is one of your hardest tasks, is to think about what is it you can offer and how well does that fit the needs of the market? You want to save the world, but there are portions of the world who don't want to be saved. If you are offering longevity, health, long-lasting life, there are those who do not seek those benefits. You're not going to have a good fit with them. You're not going to have a good market match between someone who's nihilistic, worldview is completely contrary to your live life at all costs, live for as long as you can, versus live fast, die young. So your segments won't match. And it's up to you whether you decide if that's an important product offer to counter offer. And the last consideration for this set of the variables is who else is in the market? Who else are you up against? And I don't just mean in terms of if you are selling alcohol prevention, you know that you are up against the alcohol industry. But you're also, if you're selling an anti-drinking, clean living lifestyle, you're not the only people trying to get the attention for this audience. You are in crowded markets. If you are targeting a 20 to 22 year old full-time university student to engage in a health campaign, you want them to exercise minimum one hour a day, physical training, physical activity, outside, you know, go up and do stuff. The ANU is a your direct competitor because assessment tasks 
start between weeks 4 and finish sometime after week 13. There is a uh, minimum of a 10, realistically a 15 week window in which there are other priorities on that, your target audience's lifestyle and that happens twice a year. So you're now at 30 weeks of 52 where go out and get fit, go out and train is clashing against spend time on assessment tasks. So understand the competitions, understand the pressures on your audience. And pick accordingly. Pick who's going, do you go into the deep competition? Do you go into the light competition? The other thing you want to look at in your targeting is your type of customer. And this leads you to a whole activation of consumer behavior theory. When you come into this framework of target marketing, when you look at these decisions, you are enabling your choice through consumer behavior frameworks. Yes, if I talk about I talk about CV. The end user has to adopt. And this is how they're going to do it. So who's your target market? Of your customers, can you tell me about their decision making processes? Can you tell me who buys, who pays the price for the social marketing product? And why? What's their choice of criteria? Why do they make that decision? When do they make that decision? Does it differ from, if you're looking at one group who buys, does it differ from the people who uses? People who buy, do they differ from people who use? Are there different uses for the social product? Are there different distribution locations, different distribution outlets? Do the audiences change between those outlets? Do they change by rationale for purchase? Do they change by rationale for engagement? The other things you need to be thinking about is, again, this is now talking to the long-term commercial marketing adaptation for social marketers. Your current customers will change. If you do your job properly as a social marketer, the audience you address today will be different. They will change because you get it right. They will change because you change them. And that is ultimately the beauty and the terror of social marketing. So if we do our jobs properly, behavioral change happens. The audience becomes different. They experience the product. This is also why it's vital to think about does the audience have any prior track record of dealing with the type of product or type of social solution or type of social problem that you are presenting? Because if they've had no experience and you give them their first experience, the next time you address that same audience, they will have, they will be different. So you'll go from, I have to tell them what the problem is, to I have to tell them what the solution is, to I have to reinforce that they're getting benefit from that solution. At our services, we know that perception governs reality, expectation governs, expectation Governs perception in the sense of what you expect is your zone of tolerance about whether it exceeds your expectations or is lower than your expectations. We also know that experience changes perception. So your strategy gets to change if you've addressed this audience previously versus if they're a new audience. You also have to deal with the fact that if you are competing against someone else, that's Competition in that marketplace will change expectation. If you have set out to address an audience that is currently getting hit by a range of social change messages from other providers, the success or failure of those other providers will also impact 
on the audience's willingness to engage with you. If they've been, if you come up to an audience and go, if you take drugs, you will die. And the other audience, and they're like, no, that's not how it works. Um, that's, that doesn't happen. And then your road safety crew comes rolling and saying, if you speed, you will die. By the time the third campaign that goes and says, do not touch the electrical wires, it will kill you. People are going, meh, what's the likelihood the last two campaigns were wrong? You have to think about what are the messages the competitors are sending? What will that do to the expectations that your audience that you're dealing with will encounter? You're also looking at, uh, in terms of, again, we're thinking targeting. Future customers. We're thinking of this as the long game. So after your first market, who's your second market? Who's your sequel? What changes? What emerges? Who are the new markets that emerge? And particularly, once you start providing your social solution, you will change the game. You will find emergent markets that will come up because your solution is satisficing. It's getting part of the way there. So there's a new market opportunity to move them one step further. As I mentioned earlier, your audience will age and they will mature. And you have to ask yourself the question, do you pick a demographic block and continue with them? So you found a five year window, you identified them in 2016, so between 2016 and to 2021, this five year window, rolling window, do you then at 2021 go back to the original target audience or do you, the original descriptor of the target audience? So say we pick 18 year olds, people turning 18 in 2016 to people turning 18 in 2021, uh, do we then go back to 18 year olds? In 2022, do we run the campaign for 18 year olds again? Or do we stay with this audience that we have matured with, that have grown up with? And this is, a, this is a question that commercial marketers deal with on a regular basis. Do we sack our customers and take the new shifting demographic cohort? Or do we age up with them? And one of the other questions that as a practitioner, social marketing practitioner, and why research is so important and why I really lean on you to use the theories, to explore the databases, to look at what else has been done, is we're not always the first game in town. So the question is, has the target audience heard of the behavior before? Is this a new to us behavior or a new to them behavior? Because we come sweeping in saying, hey, check out this amazing new idea. And it's been done before and failed in that audience. We've lost them. The other question you want to be asking in terms of willingness is, is the audience that you are targeting keen to try out this behavior? Do they want to do this? Are they clamoring? Uh, is there a social problem that they've identified, that you've identified, and they're clamoring for support? They want the assistance, but no one's prepared to support them because then, yeah, they're just, no, oh, they're not nice. They're not the right kind. I mean, it's not the audience we really want. And in social marketing, we get that on a regular basis. Usually, you can pony up a bit of money to go beat up on teenagers. If you want to run an anti-alcohol campaign targeted at 16 to 18 year olds pre-legal drinking, there's money to be found. But there's also more campaigns addressing these kids than you can honestly poke a stick at. And they're all 
going after an audience who just doesn't care. If you have chosen at 14 to engage in alcohol consumption, you've done it for rational decision making. You've got your reasons. And unless we counter offer you on those reasons, you're not going to change. So desire, IADA, stages of change campaign, a whole lot of different metrics are in here. Your target decision is have they heard of the behavior? Are they aware of it? Are they interested? Iada, Iada. Do they desire change? Are they ready to act? And the final thing, as a commercial marketer and as a social marketer, as a practitioner, market perception is mission critical. Uh, this, this is where we talk about ethnography, interview, qualitative, boots on the ground. You get out of the office, you Go to where your audience is going to be and you talk to the audience and you observe the audience. So if you want to understand teenagers and teenage drinking, go to a, get a time, get permission, go to a school and talk to them about everything other than teenage drinking. Talk to them about their weekends, talk to them about their stress their life, their pressures, their concerns, their hopes, their fears. Understand them and you will find their perception of the product, of the campaigns. If it's a problem and they know it's a problem, if you're talking to them about their life, this problem will come out of that conversation. If it's a problem they haven't recognized yet, then you know that you've got an awareness issue. If it's a problem they're talking about going, yeah, I just don't know what to do about it then you've got a desire, you've got an actionable outcome. So you need to do this as a, as a practitioner. You've got to get out there and understand what does the market think? Do they think it will solve the problem? Do they think it will make a difference? And that's the most important thing, is giving people a chance to say, look, I like the idea, but I don't think it's going to do anything. That means that you need to think about the pricing, the payoff. There's a bunch of product decisions that come with understanding your target's willingness. All right, last parts of the proceedings. This is about opening the toolbox of consumer behavior and going for the right sized hammer screwdriver, monkey wrench, saw, and whatever else you need to understand the thought processes of the people who you're about to influence. Because ultimately, social marketing is about changing the behavior of individuals collectively to change the behavior of groups, organizations, businesses and governments. It's all about the mind, the attitude that leads to the behavior, the knowledge, the awareness that leads to the problem recognition. All these are the theories that will make the difference. And here's how it gets critical. Now, the trans theoretical model of behavioral change, the stages of change model, there is no more important social marketing decision than this one. Because this is where you win your audience or you lose your audience. If your audience has no idea that there is a problem and they're in pre-contemplation, then education and awareness is a step, is the first step that you need. If you don't know, what you don't know can kill you. If you don't know a behavior is dangerous, you need to be told that the behavior is dangerous. But 
if you know that the behavior is a problem and you're in contemplation and you know your behavior is dangerous, you don't need to be told. This is ultimately the crux of the difference between education campaigns and social marketing campaigns is that education assumes everyone is always in pre-contemplation. That the reason why somebody does a negative social behavior, well, the person went out and drinking and driving because they didn't know it was dangerous. There is nobody in the Australian marketplace who pilots a vehicle, legally or illegally, who is not aware of drink driving as a prohibited activity. The people who drink and drive, drink and drive because the benefits of drink driving outweigh the costs of drink driving. It is a rational decision. It is a decision that is often made under the influence, but it is made as a calculative risk. What are the odds of me getting caught? What are the benefits of me drinking and driving? Am I likely to get caught? No. Is the cost of not drinking and driving greater than the cost of drinking and driving? Yes, you can drink and drive. And alcohol consumption in rural communities where there's limited public transport and expensive private transport, it's cheaper to drink and drive and drive home, go to the pub, get drunk and drive home drunk, because even if you get done for drink driving, the fine that you will pay on that time you get caught will be less than the cost you will incur financially of doing the right thing all the other times. There's no pre-contemplation in it. So education doesn't work unless there's pre-contemplation. Contemplation works when you know that there's a problem, but you don't know if there's a solution. Contemplation doesn't work is that where you know that there's a solution, you know that there's a problem, you know that there's a solution, but you haven't been able to enact the solution. You want things to be different, and this is preparation. You want things to be different. You are looking for enabling information and behaviours and resources to get you from I'd like to solve that problem to going out and actually solving it. Action is when you are doing the first trial runs, when you are trying out the solution. You are behaving differently. So action requires infrastructure, resourcing, support. If you are going to get someone to be, to engage in the right behavior and they're in action, you need to facilitate. So you want people to use clean needles each time they inject, you need to have a wide range of needle supply points. You need people to be able to access fresh and clean needles when they need them. You need those needles to be priced at the right level. People know that they need to use clean needles, but if there's no need clean needles available, they still need to inject. Diabetics are not gonna just go, ah, oh, yeah, listen, it wasn't a clean needle, so I'll just go into a coma for a bit. It's not how it's going to work. So action is about ensuring that when people are acting, they can, in, people are doing the behavior, the resources they need to support them are available. Maintenance, however, is different from action. Maintenance is about dealing with post-purchase, post decision making, it's dealing with cognitive dissonance, it's dealing with payoff, it's dealing with the delay between doing the right thing and getting a reward. You're trying to consolidate the gains. So maintenance, action is ensuring that the act that you are desiring, the behavior or the attitude, 
has the resources necessary to facilitate. Maintenance is about making certain once you've acted, you feel this was in your best interests. So as a commercial marketer, if we are thinking about bringing a new video game into existence, pre-contemplation is where nobody knows that we're working on a product. We then have a soft launch, or a trial launch, or a product announcement. People go to contemplation, ooh, there's a new game coming out. Preparation is where we start announcing the product specifications, or giving out demo versions, or getting people to sign up to beta tests. Action is getting them to buy, and maintenance is getting them to play, and then buy the DLC and the associated. So these are steps, and each step you need, you do different things in your marketing strategy. And this is why segmentation, led by consumer behavior, using target marketing is critical. You can run these steps, and as a practitioner, you would be running a block of campaigns from pre-contemplation to maintenance. There would be different audiences. There would be people just coming into the audience blocks. There are people out there who are about to open their first Harry Potter novel, having never encountered Harry Potter before. They will read this, the first words for the first time of a product that will be a classic everybody knows. Oh man, everybody knows the story of this. There are people out there who will be in pre-contemplation to major commercial brands who will be completely blissfully unaware of some of the brands that you hold dear to you. There are people out there who don't know about certain sports that are in the not just in the Olympics, but in the people out there who haven't really heard of soccer. They're in a pre-contemplation phase for soccer or cricket. Each of these elements triggers a different set of marketing behaviors. So you want to know in your segment which step are they at because that's going to determine your marketing mixes. Now, I want to raise a couple of other theories. Uh, if you can, get your hands. Well, the best CB books that's out there is the Quester, Neil, Pettigrew, Grimmer, Davis, Hawkins. Now, I draw stuff from the fifth edition because that's the one I have, and it's not quite a signed copy, but I'm very fond of that one. Other segmentation variables that market that consumer behavior lets us work with. Group influences. Needs, emotions, values, and personalities, demographics and household structure, purchase and use behavior. These are theories that are vitally important. They influence the way in which people consume. And ultimately, we are marketers. We are social marketers. We are in the business of getting someone to consume our idea or our behavior or our belief. We want them to act in a way that is pro-social, is a benefit to us in our campaign. So we need to look at these influences on consumer behavior, just like we do as commercial marketers. So this brings up one of the real straight, flat, basic decisions that you want to have thought through is in terms of the social solution that you are providing is it influenced by the consumption situation. Does the audiences, does your target audiences desired behavior change by who is with them? Does the audience change in terms of do the do the product characteristics of the solution influence their behavior? Do their own personal traits influence the desired behavior or their willingness to adopt the desired behavior? Now, the other, oh, this is one of my also all-time favorite models. Um, any opportunity to break out 
Bequesta cheese wheel. Think consumer behavior. Think social marketing. Segmentation variables are in the cheese wheel. Look at your options for segmenting and targeting and positioning. And then look at the consumer behavior decision framework. For your social solution, are you targeting problem recognition? Are you trying to get people to realize that there's an issue? Are you dealing with people who know there's an issue and they're trying to understand more about it? Are you one of possible one of many possible alternatives that could be undertaken to reach a sort of similar end game social solution to the social problem? Are there alternatives? Are people at the point of decision? Like, yes, I wish to change. What are my options? And have, and here's one for you. Have people adopted your social solution and they're now in the post-purchase cognitive dissonance phase and you're needing to reinforce them. You're needing to, they've adopted it and now they're swinging back around a problem recognition because it's just not quite done the job. So one more theory block that you also want to consider. The situational influence. Now this is the role of situation and consumer behavior. This is where you are going to be looking at the classic simulation or simulate organism response model is one of the classics. What this has in it is situation influences the type of product and influences the consumer's behavior. So we swing back to look at this in terms of in any given scenario, there are a set of influences on top. This is the old, uh, old classic Velk. For someone to adopt your social product, does it differ by physical surroundings? Does it differ by social surroundings? If it does, if you say yes to any of these situational influences, this is a basis upon which you can segment a market and upon which you can target. Now, if it's antecedent state since the temporary personal state, oh, good luck. That's a rough one. All of us commercial marketers hate dealing with that one, particularly services marketers. Antecedent states are the worst. You come in, you've got a headache, you're tired, you're grumpy. It doesn't matter how good the service performance is, you're not up to having a service performed on you. You can go see a movie with a headache and it's a terrible experience, and the movie can be objectively great. It's just you had a bad experience, so your antecedent states are a bit rubbish like that. But for the rest of it, task definition, temporal pressure, Social surrounding, physical surrounding. These are segmentation variables. These are influences from consumer behavior that when you look at your audience, if we take temporal pressure, it's the last framework to consider here. Will someone adopt your social cause and go with the social solution you're presenting if they're short on time. Will you jaywalk or will you wait at the traffic lights? The time pressure, there's no one there. Social surroundings, there's no presence. There's no cars, there's no people. Will you wait. 
And that is the temporal pressure, that's the social surroundings. People will differ in their behaviours, whether they're observed or unobserved. And this is the question that you want to really cash in. The situational influences are variables that you can segment around. And the other, and the situational influences, by the way, is one other thing here is to consider, come back to these when we are looking at designing your marketing mix. Where will people receive the communication? And this is incredibly valuable and immensely important as a social marketer. If you are going to send out a social message that is controversial, for which there are negative consequences to the individual adopter being caught with this information. Basically, if there is a risk you're going to out someone to their family, to their community, to their partner, by sending the pro-social message to them to get them to engage in safe behavior, then you need to understand all of these situations and you need to not screw it up because you can kill people with your communication strategies. And that is one of the things about being a social marketer is that we also ask you to really deeply understand the ethical ramifications of your segmentation strategy and of your product delivery strategy of if you are asking someone to communicate to receive a message and that message has a controversial element to it it's got a cost communication purchase situation usage situation disposal situation all of these elements become factors to consider in the marketing mix but there are also elements that alongside situation and situational influence these factors let you use the strength of marketing. Because this is what we do really well. We understand. We create just-in-time solutions. We created the vending machine because temporal pressure. We created the vending machine that is set away from the rest of the public so it can be accessed in private so you reduce the social presence of others. But at the same time, we created the glows in the dark, very well lit electronic car refueling points so that they were visible in the physical surroundings so people could see them. We created social surroundings that put people in proximity so that the bystander effect could be manipulated. We modified physical surroundings to create the material environment that enabled people to walk safely from point A to point B as an exercise metric to reduce car consumption. And we reversed that. We cut footpaths so it was harder to walk so we could sell more cars. We cut library services so people had less places to commune and be in community with each other so that we could sell more products. We could sell the isolation, individualism, because that sold a certain ideological self-dependence, self-sufficiency. So these influences count, they matter. The theory frameworks that we can use to change people's behavior. At the end of the day, that's what we do. We're social marketers, we change your ideas, we change your attitudes, we change your behaviours. In theory, we do it for social good.